Okay, what this is, is a roughly 10 minute movie on the foundations of ECG. I'm mainly going to focus on the three lead system called Eindhoven's Triangle, lead one, lead two, and lead three. But the same principles apply to the augmented leads and the precordial leads, so you should be able to easily extend this into a solid foundation for understanding 12 lead ECG. If you don't know what I'm talking about when I say augmented or precordial, we'll get to that in a second. I want to be really clear at the beginning that I'm no MD, I'm no diagnostician, I'm no expert on ECG. I've never really looked at an ECG that mattered other than my own. I am also not trying to turn you into an expert or a diagnostician. What I do have is a background in electrophysiology that makes me very curious about understanding exactly how the ECG works. Also, I'm a teacher, and I found as a teacher it's much easier to explain to somebody how something works than how something is. What I mean is, if you've explained to somebody how something works, then they can constantly adapt that knowledge into new situations. But if you just tell people how it is, then that's just memorization, and you have to memorize every different situation that is. I've read a lot of ECG books, and I've really tried to figure out how it works. But most of those ECG books come at it from the point of view, if you see this, this is what it means, and I consider that how it is kind of knowledge. So these books give a little background on Itov and tell you about the leads, then move quickly into if you see this, it means that. And back to what I was saying, in that case, you have to memorize a lot of if you see this, it means that. Whereas if you can create kind of an understanding, then you can kind of predict almost if the ECG looks like this, it must mean the voltages are traveling through the heart this and that way. And I think that's a much more powerful method to understand ECG. It may not work best in the ER to do it that way, and I will concede that. But it's a good way for students, like my students that are pre-nursing students, to at least have an appreciation of what's going on in the ECG. Along those lines, I think it's a valuable skill to be able to recognize some major components of ECG or kind of understand what's going on, to be able to extend beyond just typical lead to ECGs where you see the PQS and T, but to understand what those other leads are showing you. I think it's valuable, one, because I think nursing students are going to see more and more 12 lead ECGs, but also I think it's just about college, it's about skills, it's not always about facts. And in this ECG, if you look on the left, there's three minor pieces of the puzzle that are not that difficult to understand on their own. But what can be difficult is to assemble those into a complete picture. But once you have done that, once you have acquired that skill, not only is it going to help you understand ECG, but that skill is going to be important in health. In health, you often have to put simple pieces of the puzzle together into a more holistic, a more complete understanding. So even if you know that you're never going to look at an ECG again, I still think it's a valuable skill to try and understand 12 lead ECG, to assemble the small parts into a complete understanding. The last thing I want to say before I get started on how to teach the ECG is some of the things I'll say are a little different than how the ECG is typically taught. I've had to turn to electrical engineering sources in order to find out how the voltage actually travels through the heart so that I can account for how the leads pick up every single deflection in the ECG. So you understand what the Q wave is, what the S wave is, and all those things. I will point out those resources as I go along, but again, some of the stuff that I say is going to be a little bit different than a typical textbook will say. Things like that apical repolarization occurs behind the QS. That's not likely how it actually happens because the action potential in the autorhythmic cell is much shorter than the duration between the P wave and the QRS. Going up the P wave is atrial depolarization. Going down the P wave is repolarization. And the common way the P wave is taught is that's apical depolarization and repolarization occurs within the QRS. That doesn't really make sense from the point of view of how long the action potential in the atria lasts, and it doesn't make sense in the sense that that doesn't help you understand each of the deflections in the ECG. And it's also not backed up by what's known by bioelectrical engineers. I will send you out to those sources, but let me first go through the three simple rules. And I've listed them on the left of this document. The first rule, and I'm just going to say that these rules real quickly, and then we'll go through them in detail. The first piece of the puzzle, or the first rule, is you have to know the cardiac conduction cycle. And again, it's a little bit different here than it might be in your average textbook, in your normal textbook. The second piece of the puzzle is to understand the various leads. The third piece of the puzzle is to understand how the leads pick up voltages. So a combination of those first two steps. I got the voltage changes. I know the leads. How do those leads report the voltage changes? The first thing I want to do is go through the conduction cycle, but before we go through that, I want to take you out to these sources. One of the first sources that I'll take you through is www.bem.fi, and this is a book on bioelectric magnetism. I like this one down here, the red book. And if you go to this, there's three particular chapters that I'd point out. Chapter 6 on the heart. And I like this one because it shows you how activation of the atria and activation of the ventricles 
is reflected in the PQRS and T's. So you see that the action potential in the atria actually is too short to extend much into the QRS. Atrial depolarization causes the rise in the P wave, and atrial repolarization that occurs here actually causes the decrease in the P wave. And this is pretty much done before you even get into the QRS. So I like that figure. It explains that for us. I also really like this figure. It's from Durer et al. in 1970. If you stare at it long enough, you'll see that what it shows us is that depolarization begins in the inside of the heart, the septum. So red means early on in depolarization. Depolarization flows around the ventricle free wall, and the last place that you get depolarization is the back right portion of the heart. So when I do the steps in depolarization, I'm going to say that depolarization occurs by going up and around the back of the heart, and this figure is what I'm referring to. Depolarizations go up the side of the heart, well first heads down the septum, across the septum, down to the apex, up the ventricular free wall, and around to the back. I also really like chapter 15, because it takes us through the 12 lead ECG, and you'll see these figures throughout this video. The last one is a very good figure to round it all up. It's the basis of ECG diagnosis, and they have very nice figures that show you what can go wrong in the ECG and how those would be reflected in the ECG. So what can go wrong with the heart and how those would be reflected in the ECG. Everything from bradycardia to tachycardia to arrhythmias, wandering pacemakers, how it would change essentially the shape of the P wave, flutter, fibrillation. It's a very good source. Take you through bundle branch blocks. I'm not going to steal their thunder by showing everything really, really slow. I'm going to send you over to them because it's a very, very good source. Another very good source, and I'm going to be a little cautious about taking you to there because I don't want to violate copyright. I've asked for permission, but I haven't gotten that permission yet is go to this book, Investigative Electrocardiography and Epidemiological Studies and Clinical Trials. There's some very good figures in there. I'd specifically refer you to figures 1.2, 1.6, 1.11, 1.14, and 1.16. They've got some very good figures in there that clarify exactly how voltage flows around the arts, and that flow is the basis of how I've constructed my voltage vectors that describe the cardiac conduction cycle. So if you have concerns about my cardiac conduction cycle, the six steps that I'm giving, because those are not always the same six steps that are given in most textbooks, then please refer to these sources to back up what I'm saying. You can also go to springerlink.com and search for the book, and you can gain access that way. So let's then start going through these pieces of the puzzle a little bit more in detail. And the first piece of the puzzle is understanding the cardiac conduction cycle. More specifically, understanding the six steps that I have here. Depolarization of the atria, repolarization of the atria, septal depolarization, apical depolarization, left ventricular depolarization, and then repolarization of the ventricle. Depolarization of the atria begins in the SA node as voltage flows across the heart. And we're going to find in a second that an ECG does not pick up all voltage changes. It adds them together into one single vector. That's why I've described depolarization of the atria as one single red arrow. Repolarization of the atria is represented by the orange arrow. Now, I haven't included it in here, but we have the AV node that when voltage travels across the atria, it pauses in the AV node before it heads down the septum. It pauses for about a tenth of a second. Once we start heading down the septum, Technically, the voltage heads down the left side of the heart, the left bundle branch, a little bit before the right bundle branch. This causes a short and very brief directional flow from the left of the heart to the right. That's called septal depolarization. Next, we got apical depolarization, where the voltage travels down the rest of the way of the septum towards the apex of the heart. Technically, and this goes back to what I just said, that the ECG picks up a single directional flow of electricity. It doesn't pick up individual flows of electricity or flows of voltage. It picks up singular flows, so it averages things together. Technically, voltage is traveling up the left ventricle and the right ventricle, but the ECG sums them into one arrow, the green arrow here, which is apical depolarization. That voltage ceases traveling up the right much sooner than the left, so we shift our attention completely over to the left ventricular wall. The left ventricular wall is much thicker than the right ventricular wall, and so the left pretty much takes over at this point. Our voltage goes up the ventricular free wall, and it heads around the back of the heart. Repolarization can begin before depolarization is completely finished. It tends to follow a pathway much like depolarization. So down the septum, up the ventricular free wall, and around the back of the heart.